Uh, our first speaker is Jeffrey Landis. Uh, jo Jeffrey is a, a scientist at NASA John Glenn Research Center and also a science fiction author. He's going to be speaking to us this evening about memories of MIP. Welcome, Jeffrey. Oh, good afternoon. I'm Jeff Landis. I've been introduced, I guess, but thank you all for taking time out of your dinner hour to uh, come listen to me. So even as we speak, the MOXIE, the Mars Oxygen Experiment, is on its way to Mars uh, with the Perseverance rover. And uh, I think we ought to take just a moment to realize just what an incredibly historic occasion that is. For the very first time, we are going to be manufacturing rocket fuel on Mars. This is something we have dreamed of for decades and decades. <clears throat> well, Mike Hecht actually already gave a great talk about MOXIE uh, in yesterday's session. I hope you all heard it. Uh, but I want to go back in time a little bit, uh, talk about history and context, and maybe have an opportunity to tell you uh, about MIP, the Mars ISPP precursor, which was the first flight experiment that was intended to go to Mars and develop propellant production uh, on another planet. So we'll go back to 1995 and 1996. That was a few years before the Mars Society was even founded. Uh, that was before there was really a real push to go to Mars. Now there were the crazies of the Mars underground. Uh, people like Carol Stoker and people like Chris McKay that said, yes, Mars is the next place to go. But it was a very long way away. A lot of people had been proposing for a while, even at that point, that Explore, exploring another planet would be far more effective if you could use the local resources, in particular to use the resources to make fuel for the return voyage. At the time, they called this ISPP, in situ propellant production. Later, they widened that a little bit, started calling it ISRU, in situ resource utilization. But since oxygen is by mass the largest fraction of rocket fuel, and rocket fuel is by mass the largest fraction of what you need, generating oxygen is the critical need. But although many people talked about it, nobody was doing anything. Well, Dave Kaplan at the NASA Johnson Space Center was in fact doing some studies that were the design reference missions for how we would go to Mars. He was saying, well, Mars is not on NASA's uh, exploration timeline right now, but if we did go to Mars, how would we do it? Uh, and actually he thought from all of his analysis, it looked like the way to go to Mars would be to use fuel that you made on Mars. But he also knew that engineers are amazingly conservative when it comes to flying technology. In fact, the motto of pretty much every spacecraft engineer is, oh, that technology is wonderful, but don't fly it on my mission. I want to fly only stuff that's already been proven. So he believed the only way to get through that roadblock of not on my mission was an actual demonstration on Mars to fly this unproven technology of making rocket fuel. Well, so he proposed, in fact, to the Human Space Systems, code M at the time, a program operating plan, POP, that we should fly a mission to Mars and demonstrate making oxygen. At this time, the Mars Pathfinder mission was almost ready to launch. Uh, it was a new way of doing planetary missions with the watchword, faster, better, cheaper. It was a very cheap mission. And in fact, he looked at it and said, wait a second, this Mars Pathfinder is going on the lowest and cheapest Delta rocket launcher. And he said, for a mere $5 million more, 
we could buy another booster, upgrade that Delta, double the payload to Mars, and fly our experiment for what by human exploration standards was just pennies. So he put this into the program operation plan and said, let's, let's do this. So it was a proposal. Uh, well, that was MIP, the Mars ISPP precursor. And here you can actually see the, uh, he was saying it's definitely rocket fuel and there's the rocket fuel. In fact, at the time, his first uh, program patch for the MIP mission actually showed Marvin the Martian holding the fuel nozzle to refuel your rocket. Turns out uh, NASA put the kibosh on that. They said, no, we're, no way we can use a franchised figure from uh, Warner Brothers as part of a mission patch. Uh, so <laughs> Marvin the Martian got left out of the mission patch. Well, at the same time, the Mars Pathfinder mission was flying. And when it landed in 1997, the first landing on Mars uh, since 1976, uh, 21 years ago, it turned out it got an amazing amount of publicity. Everybody was interested. Everybody was excited about it. So uh, as a result, the NASA administrator at the time made a commitment. He'd say, this is so great. We're going to send two low cost missions to Mars, each launch window every 26 months. It'll be one lander, one orbiter. They'll be called the Mars Surveyor Program. These would be small, fast, and cheap, and frequent. So there was the Mars Surveyor Program and the, the mission patch uh, for Surveyor. So they were talking about the follow-on. And actually, when you know a little bit about NASA bureaucracy, you say, wait a second, this was the human spaceflight directorate saying we're going to fly something on the science mission directorate. That's code M working with code S. This requires an agreement at the associate administrator level. So I was kind of working with Dave Kaplan on this proposal, but I was secretly thinking, man, this will never happen. You can never get agreement at the associate administrator level. Turns out the other thing that happened in that year was the discovery, I shouldn't say the discovery, the proposed discovery of life in a meteorite called ALH 84001. And that also got a lot of interest going, so much interest that all of a sudden exploration of Mars showed up on the radar of the Code M and the human spaceflight people who were busy building the space station at that point and said, man, we should think about the next thing. And they got that agreement between associate administrators. So MIP was there, we had a project, we had a mission to fly on it. All we needed was an experiment, a team to build the experiment and to do it on, on a short deadline and a very tight budget. Well, okay, picking an oxygen generation, the most accessible resource on Mars turns out to be the carbon dioxide atmosphere. It's accessible because it's available everywhere on the planet. You don't have to scout for it. You don't have to mine it. You don't dig it up. Uh, it's just there and we know what it is. It's 72.5% oxygen by weight, uh, plus a little bit of argon and nitrogen, which we can for the moment uh, skip. There's a couple of different methods of making oxygen from Martian carbon dioxide. If you're people who follow the Mars Society, I'm sure you've already are aware of several of these methods. In fact, uh, a couple of them were talked about in some detail in the previous talk. I hope you listened to that. Uh, selected for MIP was solid oxide electrolysis. This is essentially the same thing as the high school experiment you probably did of electrolyzing water to make oxygen come out in one side, hydrogen on the other. In this case, we're electrolyzing carbon dioxide to make carbon monoxide come out on one side, oxygen come out on the other. We do this instead of with a liquid electrolyte, it's not in solution, we use a solid electrolyte, a crystal of doped zirconia, zirconium oxide, 
uh, with a catalyst on it. It turns out at high temperatures, the zirconia is conductive to oxygen ions. So if we split the oxygen on one side of the zirconia membrane, put a little bit of electric field across it, we can recombine the oxygen ions into oxygen molecule on the other side, and we've just made oxygen by splitting the oxygen off of the carbon dioxide molecule. The carbon monoxide is a waste product, uh, but turns out there's already carbon monoxide in the atmosphere of Mars. Don't worry, we're not polluting Mars. So there's our spacecraft. That's the Mars Surveyor 2001 spacecraft, the second of the Surveyor lander missions. Uh, and there we are, uh, sort of in the corner. Uh, it's that little box, the sort of gold colored box uh, on the surface of it. A uh, little bit bigger than a shoebox, but that is the oxygen generation experiment. Actually, if you were sharp eyed and you saw the Mars Surveyor 2001 mission patch as it was originally envisioned, you saw, hey, wait a second, where's the rover? There was supposed to be a rover on this lander. Well, in the interests of small, fast, and cheap, mostly cheap, the rover eventually got kicked off the mission. Uh, part of that was it was hard to figure out how to get it off of the deck of the lander and put it on the ground. Uh, the idea actually was the robotic arm would grab it and actually pick it up and move it and put it on the ground. That needed a pretty robust uh, robotic arm. Everything started getting heavy. Uh, the people at JPL said, well, it's a little bit heavier. Sorry, no more room for MIP. Uh, we're kicking you off the experiment. Turns out the people at headquarters said, oh, sorry, if you don't have enough weight to carry the rover, we're kicking the rover off the mission. Uh, this was the first of several attempts to kick the MIP experiment off of the 2001 uh, rover. But fortunately, we had some pretty good people at headquarters that kept us on the mission. Actually, there was a reason they were so adamant in trying to kick us off the mission. The reason is the year after the agreement had been made, the then administrator at NASA, Dan Golden, said, oh, wait a second, it makes no sense that code M, the human spaceflight people, are paying for a code S flight. So tell you what, you code S guys, you just pay for everything. So even though the original agreement was that the human spaceflight people would pay for the experiment, uh, it got moved over to the budget of code S and the scientists did not like that. So that left quite a bit of ill will uh, between the science program and the human program that took quite a while to uh, get over. Well, the MIP experiment set actually comprised five separate experiments to demonstrate the key components of in situ propellant production. The Mars Atmospheric Acquisition and Compression, led by Paul Carlman at JPL, the Oxygen Generator Subsystem, led by K.R. Sridhar at the University of Arizona. He later moved to NASA Ames. Uh, the MTURC, the Thermal Environment and Radiator Characterization, led by Dave Brinza at JPL, the Mars Array Technology Experiment, led by Dave Scheiman at OAI, working with NASA Glenn, and DART, the Dust Accumulation and Repulsion Test. Uh, I was the co-I on that uh, at the time at OAI, later at NASA Glenn. Uh, I do have to mention, of course, the overall principal investigator was Dave Kaplan. It was his baby uh, right from the start. He brought in Project Mary, uh, the project manager, Jerry Sanders, uh, turned out to be a very brilliant choice on Dave's part to bring in Jerry Sanders. Uh, he was in charge of getting all the ducks lined up in a row. And I have to say, uh, sometimes the ducks did not want to get lined up in a row. Well, looking at the different pieces, uh, let's take a look. The Mars Atmosphere Acquisition and Compression uh, is what collects and compresses the atmosphere. And this was a carbon dioxide sorption pump. How that works is it's a pressure vessel. It's filled with a zeolite. This is a material that adsorbs carbon dioxide at low temperature. So if you cool it down, 
the carbon dioxide sticks to this crystal. When the temperature rises in the daytime, it gets released. So all this really consisted of uh, was a container full of this zeolite powder that could be sealed. So in the nighttime, we opened it up. It cooled down. Mars gets very cold at night at our projected landing location, I think about negative 80. Uh, carbon dioxide gets absorbed by the CO2, just like a sponge. Uh, then we close it up in the daytime, it heats up and it compresses the carbon dioxide. Uh, so the net result is we compressed it from the Mars pressure of about 0.8 atmospheres up to about half an atmosphere using nothing but the day-night thermal cycle. It didn't actually take any uh, external power except, of course, for opening and closing the, the lid on the container. Uh, that feeds into the oxygen generation system. That was K.R. Sridhar's uh, baby, supervised by, I think, Scott Baird at NASA JSC. And it was designed to produce propellant grade, pure oxygen by this zirconia electrolysis process I mentioned. Here's what's on the inside of it. What you see on the outside is just that dome. Uh, that's just a thermal dome to keep it hot because as I mentioned, it's running at about 750 degrees C. Uh, so it is a vacuum inside so that tiny little oxygen generation cell uh, can stay warm. We had a power budget of 15 watts. Uh, that was all the power that we had. Oh, and we were only allowed that power uh, during the daytime when the sun was shining. Uh, so the main purpose of the OC of the oxygen generation, the hard part, was making sure we had enough thermal insulation so that we didn't leak that whole 15 watts out to the cold Martian atmosphere. Uh, in fact, it took about 9.5 watts just to stay warm. So the remaining 5.5 watts was generating oxygen, which it did at about 0 0.04 grams per hour. And that was purely power limited. We could have produced more oxygen if we had more power. A couple more experiments that should be mentioned. Again, when we put the MIP experiment together, when we first proposed it, uh, nobody had really flown radiators on Mars. There had been the Viking experiment, got some thermal data, but questions like the effective temperature of the night sky on Mars, how much the dust impacts the ability of the radiators to radiate heat, all of these questions were really pretty much undecided. And again, uh, that conservative engineering mentality said, you know, we'd better have some experimental data before we can propose doing this for real on Mars. So MTurk was to actually test some radiators on Mars. Well, that's important because any of these processes do reject waste heat. Uh, process of making propellant is going to have to reject a lot of waste heat. So we needed to characterize and demonstrate the performance of thermal radiators, measure the night sky temperature. So there it is, that sort of white and gray checkerboard on the side of the MIP package. It included four thermal radiators, uh, two black ones, two white ones, and two of them are actually hidden behind that cover you can sort of see that in the back there, a movable cover. Uh, so these two would stay dust free because we'd keep it covered so dust wouldn't land on it. And then the other two dust would land on in order to see the effect of dust on the radiators. I'll talk about dust again in a moment. Power production on Mars is really critically a function of, well, we need to know power production uh, because that's how you make propellant. Rocket propellant basically consists of reaction mass plus energy and the power production is that energy. So we wanted to test the performance of advanced photovoltaic solar cells in the Mars environment. We wanted to measure the spectrum on Mars. We wanted to measure different types of solar cells, uh, see how they degraded, uh, basically see how the power system would work so that we could optimize the power system 
uh, for Mars. Uh, there's a picture of it just showing some of those solar cells, <clears throat> also incorporating some radiometers. I could point out the various parts of it, but uh, that's the top surface of the deck. Sitting right next to Mate was the DART experiment. Uh, we'd actually done a lot of theoretical modeling of the effect of dust on the Martian atmosphere. And the Pathfinder data suggested that, yeah, that was actually a problem. So we wanted to measure the settling rate, learn the properties of the settling dust, and try some techniques to remove or at least mitigate the dust on the solar arrays. So it had four parts, a dust accumulation monitor, it had a microscope, it had several methods to test uh, dust mitigation. We also put the sun position sensor there because uh, we need to know actually where the sun was with respect to the solar cells. Uh, here's the pieces. Dust accumul accumulation monitor was very similar to what we flew on the materials adherence experiment on Sojourner. We had an optical microscope with a resolution of about a microscope that would allow us to look at the properties of the individual dust particles. Uh, we looked at several different ways of mitigating dust, uh, ranging from the very simple method of, well, what happens if we just tilt the solar cells? Uh, to some low adhesion surface coatings. Uh, we also looked at electrostatic dust repulsion. We put a high voltage uh, between the cells uh, and an electrode to try and pop the dust off. So there it is. That's the flight hardware. Uh, about 16 inches by nine inches by 10 inches, about the size of a shoebox. Or for those of you in the space business, uh, think of it as a little bit smaller than a three-year CubeSat. Uh, weighed about 19 pounds and ran at a maximum power of 15 watts. <clears throat> so hidden underneath the gold, uh, which is just a thermal coating, uh, is the oxygen generation system, the atmospheric compression, and also all of the electronics that operates it. So the whole thing sits on the deck of the lander, it has a single cable interface that brings in our power and uh, gives our data back to the lander. <clears throat> so fabrication of the MIP, uh, actually qualification hardware for flight was completed in 1999. It was delivered for qual testing to be prepared to be integrated on the lander in the summer of 2000 for the 2001 launch. So we did a tough job, short time schedule, very small budget, and we made flight hardware on spec. And there's our spacecraft, Mars Surveyor 2001 lander spacecraft, integrated in the aeroshell, ready for testing, ready to fly to Mars, <clears throat> except one problem. In December of 99, the first of the Surveyor lander spacecraft, the Mars Polar Lander, crashed during its landing sequence. You've probably heard about that one. Our spacecraft, the 2001 lander, was an identical copy of that spacecraft, identical in any case uh, in terms of the entry, descent, and landing system. Uh, we had a different set of solar arrays, different type of camera different science package, but the landing technique was identical to the one that crashed. Review board concluded that faster, better, cheaper resulted in too many cut corners, too many safety checks that were left out, and the Mars Surveyor 2001 program was postponed. A year later, it was canceled. The spacecraft that they built uh, was actually put into storage because the 2001 spacecraft was almost ready to go. It was going to fly only a year after, uh, after that. It was put into storage. Uh, when NASA came up with the Mars Scout program uh, in one of the solicitations, they said, oh, if you want to propose a scout mission to the planet Mars, uh, go ahead and use spare NASA hardware. And that was the buzzword that meant, 
hey, we have a perfectly good spacecraft lying around. We know what's wrong with it. If you want to use it, go ahead. Uh, so that became the Mars Phoenix lander, Phoenix because it was resurrected from the dead. Unfortunately, that was a different program, a different set of experiments. Uh, they scraped off all of the experiments uh, and put their own experiments on it. Jeff, we have about five minutes to finish okay. up and answer any questions. Well, that's good. So although MIP never flew, the core concept uh, was resurrected 20 years later in the form of the MOXIE package. That's the one that's flying to Mars uh, this year. Mike Heck told you about it yesterday. Well, it's twice as big, has 20 times much more power. It produces 200 times more oxygen. But that's another story. So in conclusion, I do want to acknowledge the whole MIP team for the exceptional work. Uh, they did a great job, tight budget, tight schedule, and we were on time, on spec, on budget. I'd name you all by name, but that's too many to, to list, and I'd probably skip some of you. So uh, great job, guys. Thanks. And with that, I believe I'm uh, ready for questions. Excellent. Thank you, Jeff. We do have a few questions for you. Uh, Raphael asks, how does the MIP demonstrate that rocket fuel can be manufactured on Martian soil for the return trip on Earth? Yeah, well, the key was we weren't manufacturing it from the soil. Uh, we were manufacturing it from the atmosphere. And the nice thing about the atmosphere is we know it's there everywhere on Mars. Uh, so we were just manufacturing the oxygen. So for this particular case, we would have had to bring the fuel part of the propellant uh, from Earth. So when I say rocket fuel, uh, perhaps I should be more specific. We're making rocket propellant, but we're making the heavy part of the propellant. We're making the oxygen part. We'd still have to bring uh, the fuel to burn with the oxidizer uh, from Earth. So we were just making oxygen. Thank you. Uh, Rodrigo asks, were you involved in the various uh, ISRU oxygen extraction tests conducted in Hawaii, Roxygen and uh, Pilot and Resolve? And do you know what came out of those tests? Yeah, that was after the end of the MIP experiment. I wasn't part of that. Uh, Jerry Sanders was part. Uh, Diane Linney at NASA Glenn was part of that. A couple of other of the people that I've worked with. Uh, not, however, something that I was part of. Uh, they've done actually quite a few different technologies for uh, making oxygen. There's a number of things that are ready to try, uh, but so far, uh, this is the second attempt to send one to Mars with MOXIE. So we'll see how that works. But no, I wasn't involved with the Hawaii experiments. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, and then Anara asks, what do you think is the most important project being run in NASA at the moment and why? What's the most important project? Wow. There's so many great things that are happening. I mean, missions to asteroids. We have Juno in orbit, orbit around uh, Jupiter. Uh, we have a helicopter on its way to Mars. Another helicopter that will be going to Titan. And of course, the moon mission, uh, I'm in favor of all of them. Uh, I think we should go to space with humans. We should go with robotics. We should do science. We should settle space. Uh, so I'm in favor of every single one of them. They're all important. Sorry to <laughs> dodge the question. I must no, be No, that's all right. It's hard I to like place one above another. <laughs> it's like loving children. Yes. Uh, Daniel asks, and I think this is the last question that we have time for. Uh, Daniel asks, was testing and re uh, replicating temperature and atmosphere performed? Uh, yeah. Yeah, this was tested in a, a thermal vacuum chamber, uh, looking at the temperature, looking at the atmosphere. Uh, <clears throat> basically, it went through the full qual test uh, and then was uh, put in a warehouse and, as far as I know, is still there. Okay, sorry for the bit of the hiccup here, but we're gonna go ahead and just take some general questions while uh, 
we wait for our next panelist. Uh, so if anybody has any questions, please go ahead and ask them and we'll, we'll uh, have the panelists that are here answer them. So Patrick Selby, I'm gonna let you go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, <clears throat> this is Patrick. Uh, I had a question for Jeff. The, uh, regarding the oxygen generator mm -hmm. uh, on Mars, uh, Creating methane on Mars, would that be a similar process as the oxygen generator that you guys were working on? It turns out actually that methane on Mars is a different process. Uh, you don't do it by electrolysis. Uh, you probably do it by the Sabatier process. Those of you who are familiar with Bob Zubrin's work uh, probably are pretty familiar with the Sabatier where you take uh, hydrogen react it with carbon dioxide making uh, methane and water. It turns out if you're going to burn the uh, methane, you need more oxygen than you produce by Sabatier. So you still need to do a, an oxygen production. Okay, so they would probably work hand in hand then, it sounds like. It would. An alternative would be to take some of the methane you make and then pyrolyze it uh, and then just throw away the carbon that you make and then use the hydrogen to, uh, to make more. Uh, but yeah, probably you would uh, use both the zirconia electrolysis and also the Sabatier. Gotcha, cool, thank you. Hikaru, I'll go ahead and let you uh, unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, this is to Jeff. Thank you for the talk. Um, it was interesting to listen to all the politics and how hard it was to um, do the ISRU on Mars. So I was wondering, what do you think, like how long do you think it takes for more various ISRU methods to be actually tested in space? Because if it was so hard for MIP, I was wondering if people are trying to do different type of ISRU, not only for propellant or fuels, but um, would you expect it would take many years for them to be actually tested? Yes. Uh, there are many, many people who are doing ISRU experiments on the Earth. Uh, there's experiments with a lot of solid oxide electrolysis, there's Sabatier, there's reverse water gas shifts being made. The real sticking point, the hard part, has been getting somebody to fly them in a test uh, mission on Mars. I am certainly hoping that Mike Heck's MOXIE experiment will break that logjam and people will say, wow, uh, let's do this. Uh, but it has taken a lot of work trying to convince the mission engineers to fly the untested technologies. Uh, it's, uh, it's very yeah. hard. I'd love yeah. to see a Sabati I fly in a future mission though. Um, I really wanna see that. How many years or decades would you be your guess? Well, we could do it on the next mission if we chose to do it. Mm -hmm. Right now, NASA is, I think, hoping that the next mission will actually be the sample return mission. Now, if I were in charge of NASA, I would do the sample return mission using in situ generated propellant because I think showing in situ generated propellant and actually launching a rocket from Mars is the next most important thing. The very most important thing we could do to get a Mars mission moving. Uh, yep. But the spacecraft engineers don't ever want to fly a new technology if they can mm -hmm. avoid it. Yeah. Um, so how long do you think it takes for the era to come where many diverse set of ISRU technologies can be tested um, often? Well, I am hoping that with the new low cost launch vehicles, that the cost of doing missions to Mars is going to be reduced. 
uh, we've already seen a lot more missions to Mars this year than there's ever been. Mm -hmm. uh, so I hope that very, very soon, uh, Elon Musk was saying that he was hoping to do Starship flights to Mars, not the next launch opportunity, but the launch opportunity after that in four years from now. And that would be a perfect opportunity to do some ISRU testing. So nice. cross your fingers. Let's hope we can do it in, uh, in four years. Yeah, that's great to hear. Thank you. I, I'm cheering for Elon. I hope he gets his Starship flying. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. Any uh, any other questions? Jerry Stone, you have a question. Go ahead. Thanks very much. Uh, as we're talking about uh, Starship and bearing in mind what the Saturn V could get to the moon and how little um, was put down and, and came back, I mean, with Starship, we're talking about landing an absolutely huge vehicle by comparison on the moon and we're also talking about sending it to, to mars and I, okay so once you're there if you can make your return fuel whilst you're there then fine but um i mean really the question for many people is how do you get that much mass out there in the first place I mean, how does Starship's cap capabilities compare, say, with how much the Saturn V could send um, on uh, en route to the moon? Yeah, I don't know if I have a good answer to that. Uh, because I'm not sure if I've seen the details of Elon's plans. I'm pretty sure that it does involve in-space refueling. So you do many launches from the Earth just to launch the fuel to, to get to and land on Mars, uh, which is one way to uh, avoid making an absolutely humongous uh, launch from Earth. But I'm not actually sure of the details of, of his plan. Okay, so uh, we're effectively talking about uh, Earth orbit rendezvous as yes, the indeed. mission plan. <laughs> yeah, not only Earth orbit rendezvous, but also uh, uh, fuel transfer, which so far has not really been demonstrated in space. But... Uh, so it's it's tricky. Ah, I see Bruce McKenzie just answered that in Q and A. So thank you, Bruce. Patrick, do you have another question? Um, I sure did. Yeah, for Jeff as as well. The um, the original oxygen generation system that you that you worked on in two thousand or two thousand one. How is it a lot different than the sort of the Moxie system that they're doing now? Um, you, you mentioned the capacity is more, but is there fundamentally any uh, design or technology that has changed in the 20 years? The fundamental technology is the same. A lot of the details are very, very different. And I do have to point out that we just wanted to show that we could do it. Uh, the MOXIE project is putting out a, a much higher amount of oxygen, about 200 times more oxygen than we were doing. Hey, <laughs> right for those guys. <laughs> Good work. Uh, the fundamental technology is the same. Uh, they have a much more refined version uh, of the solid oxide electrolysis. Uh, we also went with the sorption pump. So the Zeolite basically serves as a sponge for the carbon dioxide atmosphere. Uh, they went with a more conventional vacuum pump. They're using a Yeah, hello. 
I just realized I was talking into a muted mic, so. Sorry, that might have been my fault, Jeffrey. It, it got quiet there just for a second. You were talking about the vacuum pump. Uh, yeah, so we use the sorption pump. Uh, they moved to a scroll pump, which is a more conventional type of vacuum pump. Probably, probably a good move. Uh, there's a lot of technology that's been done on that type of pump. So they're using a type of pump that has a, a pretty long history. It's way down the, the learning curve. As we and, I, and I would think if you have more than 15 watts to work with, it, it opens up additional possibilities as well. Yes. Cool, thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Next is Pankaj. Pankaj, do you have a question? Yes. Uh, uh, my question is, how would the soft landing of the Starship be possible on the surface of the moon? Well, it's a rocket powered lander, so you'd think it should be pretty straightforward on the moon. Uh, they use the atmosphere for stabilization. They use the little fins at top to to keep the top side up as it's moving downward. Uh, but there's been a lot of people who have looked at the question of actively controlled vertical landing and it seems to be a, a solvable problem. So it's a rocket powered landing. Okay, right. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Pankaj. Uh, Jerry Stone, do you have another question? Uh, I do uh, actually, and it's uh, on a completely separate uh, area. Uh, Jeffrey, uh, you're a published author, not only of books, uh, prize winning books, um, but also poems. Now, yesterday, uh, Robert said, Mars needs poets. Mm -hmm. So, um, can I ask you, do you have any? poems in space? No, uh, unless some of the people who have brought reading matter to the space station uh, haven't told me about it. As far as I know, none of my material is currently in space or has been in, in space. All right. In that case, I can make a claim. Um, I am an interplanetary poet. Specifically, uh -huh. I am a Mars poet because a poem of mine is currently in orbit around Mars on the Maven spacecraft. Uh -huh. uh, my name is on all kinds of spacecraft, um, but for Maven, the outreach team asked for something extra. They wanted people to submit a poem in the form of a Japanese haiku. And uh, my submission went we look out to space and Mars beckons us onward. Our future lies there. And they liked it and it was one of the few chosen to be placed on the craft. And so on my, on the back of my business card, where it said fellow of the British Interplanetary Society and this and that, and at the bottom it says interplanetary poet, which is oh, right. rather nice. <laughs> Hey, first interplanetary poet, at least first one I know of. <laughs> That's cool. Thank you, Jerry. Um, Mate Ravas, would you like to ask your question? Mate Ravas, are, are you able to ask a question? I cannot hear you right now. You're unmuted, though. Hello. Still... Yes, go ahead. Oh, there you are. Apologies for that. Before I ask my question, I just wanted to ask that the previous question was lovely. So thank you for asking that as well. I wanted to go back to the science bits and ask about the uh, atmospheric uh, reusing of at atmosphere. And I'm a rare breed, I'm a biologist in the panel. So I'm instead, of, uh, apart from oxygen, I'm very interested in concentrating nitrogen. 
So we'd be interested if would it be possible to concentrate and kind of harvest nitrogen with the technology that's used in, in MOXIE and MIP? You could. Uh, actually, the interesting thing about MIP was the sorption pump that we used to uh, concentrate the carbon dioxide. Uh, the exhaust stream for that was mostly nitrogen. So we were also purifying nitrogen out of that. But probably if you want nitrogen out of the Mars atmosphere, my guess is probably the way to do that uh, would be to use a liqui liquefaction. Uh, so essentially distill it out of the atmosphere the same way you would distill it out of the Earth's atmosphere to make liquid nitrogen. But with that said, I should say I've never actually looked into the question of how do you how do you get nitrogen? <laughs> Mostly we have the question of if we're trying to get carbon dioxide, how do we exclude the nitrogen? <laughs>